I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I work on the OpenShift team. Uh, I absolutely love my job. Um, I, I wasn't planning to say all this, sorry. But I started out as an intern working with um, the containers team, and that's how I got really interested in Linux containers. I now work um, up in, like, I'm working for the OpenShift installer now, but I worked with Dan Walsh as an intern, and, like, I won the lottery for internships <laughs> ever, because he's awesome. Yeah, I'm Urvashi. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat also. I'm on the OpenShift Runtimes team. I also started as an intern under Dan and still working with him, and he really is a great guy. Um, so today we're working, we're, we're going to talk about container security and how you can use them all. There's so many options. There are so many options out there um, and so much innovation going on uh, surrounding this container space. All right, before we start, how many of you were at Dan's talk in the morning? Okay, quite a few. Cool. So cool. some of you, but uh, yeah. so m some of you, or most of you, or many of you know what a Linux container is, and uh, you've gotten to maybe a few talks today where it's been discussed. But Linux containers, when we talk about them, they're normal processes running on a Linux host, and they have three things going for them: um, they're constrained, they're isolated, and they have some extra um, Linux security features added. So. How are they constrained? Well, Linux has uh, C groups is the mechanism or control groups that um, can limit the amount of resources like CPU or memory that a process on your container can use. And the isolation comes in with um, Linux namespaces. Uh, there are uh, six Linux namespaces. Um, but one, one example of a Linux namespace, it's what gives like the virtualized feel of, of a containerized process. So if I'm in a PID namespace, um, I'm a process running in a PID namespace, I think I'm the only process running on that host, and I can't see any processes running outside the host. Same thing with mount namespace. Um, you can mount a, a, a whole root FS in, inside a mount namespace, and in that way you can have like the whole Ubuntu user space inside your container and feel like you're running an Ubuntu system, but really you're just a process running on a Fedora host. So that's the idea with namespaces. And then uh, Linux also has um, seccomp for syscall filtering. Uh, they have Linux capabilities and, uh, and SE Linux to add to the um, isolation of a Linux container. So Linux containers have become super popular over the past just few years. And there's been a ton of innovation and development um, surrounding this. And, and really in two different areas. There's the container image format, and there's the container runtime. Those are like the two pieces that you need. Um, so uh, we, uh, the industry got together and formed some open standards, open industry standards, surrounding these, those two areas, the container image format, the container runtime. So now we have OCI images, Open Container Initiative. And that has um, enabled um, all sorts of development. Like now we have um, a non-traditional Linux container called host separated containers where they don't share the host kernel. Um, they uh, actually wrap each containerized process in its own uh, virtual machine. So that's like Kata containers or Gvisor or Nabla. Um, and also now we're free to um, develop all sorts of tools surrounding container, um, Linux containers, um, tools that can we know will work if we follow the OCI specs, we know they'll work with all container runtimes, and we can run any OCI image with any OCI container runtime. So standards were very um, important in, in, in moving things forward with containers. Okay, so now that we know what containers are, we can actually break the container space into four different sets of actions. These are one, building your container images, two, running and developing these containers locally, three, sharing your container images to like remote registries, moving them around from one environment to another, and four, finally running them in a, in a production cluster. Um, so what would happen if all of these functions were actually in a monolithic tool? Of course, we would end up having the least common denominator for permissions, which will affect the security of the system overall. Um, so for example, like you don't need all the privileges to run a container as you need to build container images. So why have them all together? Hence, we decided to break these actions into four different tools, uh, following the Unix philosophy, which is design programs to do a single thing, so they do it well and perform well together. And obviously, all these Unix founders are very happy that yeah, we follow that. <laughs> Um, so these tools, these four tools I'm talking about are Builder, 
uh, the name says it all, building container images, Podman for running and developing um, containers locally, Scopio for moving around container images and sharing them on container registries, as well as Cryo for running your containers in production in Kubernetes or OpenShift. So yeah, let's go through these and talk about um, how we can add security all the way through when working with containers. So the first one we're going to talk about is Builda. Builda is uh, a tool that Red Hat's been working on the, the past few years to build containers. What do I think about when I want to build securely and build secure containers? Uh, one thing um, that comes to mind is minimal images. You want to you want to create images that have as as little in them as possible um, that to minimize the attack surface. The more you have in an image, the more that can go wrong. Um, yeah, and another security feature that Builder offers is that you can actually run Builder in a container. This way you're adding an extra layer of isolation between your host and your build process. Uh, so, the contain so the new Im container images that you're building, you can give them elevated privileges that if they end up breaking out of the container, they would not affect your host in a bad way. Like, they would not be able to affect your host. Oh, um, wouldn't it be cool if we could show this live? Yeah, we have live demos for you. Oh, good. All right. So, and we've already yeah. sacrificed to the demo god, so they all go well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So here we are, um, live-ish. We're pretty live. So I'm going to show um, how easy it is with Builda to create a minimal image. Um, when I run Builda from scratch, uh, the command Builda from scratch starts a container with absolutely nothing inside. It's completely empty. You're literally from scratch. And this will spit out a working container. So um, of course, with Builda, you can use Docker files. But this is, um, I'm showing without a Docker file that you can just start a working container, plop stuff in it, and then commit it. That's what we're showing. So say I want, um, I want to install a package. I, I have one thing I need in my container. Well, my friend Nolan told me about a, um, oh, first, so if I want to do that, I want to create a mount point. Um, a mount path so that I can um, install something from my host into the container without having to have DNF in my container. Again, I, there's nothing in there. So I'm going to use my host DNF to install this small package that my friend Nolan told me has no dependencies because we're live demo and I didn't want to take forever to um, install this. And I should have hit that button while I was saying that. But anyways, we're going to get all the metadata from the, um, the Fedora repo and voila. I can tell you while we're waiting. Actually, it's pretty fast. I don't think I'm going to have time to tell you. Damn. I'll tell you later. I used, I used this last week. I'm, I created a minimal image um, in work. I, I, I'm working with the OpenShift installer, and they have a bunch of Terraform files. So with every pull request, uh, we want to make sure we run Terraform format. Um, so that requires this Terraform binary that not everybody has on their system, and certainly our CI um, didn't have it. So instead of installing it, you know, CI um, wide, I uh, oh, and we're running in Pro, so everything runs in a container. So I created a minimal container with Terraform, and, and I um, to run it in Pro. I'm just going to finish my story. To run it in Pro, you have to um, you have to volume mount the source code that you want to um, check. It's like GoLint or GoVet. You just and and so you volume out the source code, and then you also have to volume out and read write the temp directory um, because Terraform has to write to that to the temp directory to do its thing. And then you run that in Pro, and um, it's a minimal image, and it's not going to blow up the CI um, infrastructure if something goes wrong with it. There is nothing that's going to go wrong because there's only that one thing in there. All right. So now that I have installed my small um, Oh, what does it say? Ignore that. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so now I can um, commit my image. Uh, I, you notice I unmounted that directory, and I can commit it, and I'm going to call it, um, what did I call it? I called it minimal image. Okay. <laughs> there. Um, now that I have my image committed and I can just run any container run tool such as Podman, and you can see what's interesting is what's not in the image. If I try to ping, that's not there. Um, 
most packages, a lot of packages will pull, on, pull in Python. Um, I didn't need it and I don't want it, so that's not there. All this image can do is um, run BusyBox, and that's the BusyBox help menu. Pretty awesome. So again, I use the host DNF to install packages, or you know, with Terraform, I downloaded the, the zip file and unzipped it in that mount directory, and then there it was in my container. Okay, so now I'm going to do a demo on running Builder inside a container. Uh, so I have this Docker file. I already built um, an image that has Builder installed in it from Fedora before starting this demo, so you don't have to sit through that. Um, the entry point is set to Builder, so now I can use Podman to run this image, and I can do stuff like build a bud my image, and I'm telling it where my Docker file is, which is in the volume I'm mounting in, my wall. So once I do this, it's a small, simple Docker file that will, from Alpine, just set environment label and then commit it. And I can actually go in and look at what this, if this image was built by doing builder images. And as you can see, the last image, the most recent one, that's the image that was just built inside the container. Yeah, so this is all inside the container. Yeah, this is all inside the container. Um, and so now you have that image. If you could um, push it up to a registry. Yeah. You could um, you could push it over to your host. And yeah. Play around with it. Yep. Is that it for build? Oh, yeah, cool. that's it All for right, build. Let's go back to the slides. Yeah. So now the next thing we want to do is to be able to run and develop containers locally. Um, for that, we have this tool called Podman where you can manage, develop, test your containers locally. It's an all-in-one tool, more of like an entry-level tool. Um, it has basi We basically have covered everything that the Docker CLI has to offer and much more. We actually have Podman pods command as well where you can create pods. Um, so one of the cool features that comes with Podman in terms of security is that you don't need to have root privileges to run Podman. That's great. Uh, so admins can actually get away with, that give, with not giving the developers any root privileges. Uh, an added consequence that is really good about this is that it offers you compartmentalization, such that so and in the matter in the way that um, multiple users can work simultaneously on the same host machine and not be able to access each other's work. So, for example, Sally and I can be working on a host machine, but I won't I won't be able to see or even know that she has any containers or images on the host. Everything is in their own compartments. Um, adding to this compartmentalization, uh, we actually, Podman actually has this feature called user namespaces that adds to more isolation. So what user namespaces mean is that you can, uh, you can map a certain range of user IDs in the container to a different range of user IDs on the host. So I can map, for example, UID 0 in the container to UID 100,000 on the host. So my processes will have the root privilege in the container, but on the host, they'll be running as 100,000. If it breaks up, it can't cause any damage because I won't have those privileges to do so. That's um, pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> so adding to that also is that we can run each container in its own separate namespace, user namespace. What is this? Uh, this means that if, uh, if the process breaks out of the first container, it will still not be able to access the second container as it won't have the same privileges. I'll delve into this a bit further when we go back to the demos, as it's easier to see. Yeah, and uh, also with Podman, um, if you went to Dan's talk, you know there's no daemon, there's no demon there, um, no big fat demon. Uh, so Podman runs in a true fork exec model rather than that client server model that we're used to. So what that means is the child processes um, started by Podman inherit the parent login UID, and you can easily trace um, through Podman uh, who on the, on the host system has been uh, running things on running things and I can show that in the demo too I think we can go to the demo now yeah demo time so you do the root list first yeah so as I mentioned um, as you can see here I don't have student from podman so I'm going to be pulling an image by running podman in rootless mode um, when I list the images, you can see Alpine. And just for comparison's sake, I'm going to list the images using root privileges. So you can see that my root images, I have way more there than I have Alpine to just emphasize the compartmentalization I was talking about earlier. Uh, just a quick to show that it actually works by running the container. I can run Alpine and list what is there in my home directory. Um, yeah, so now back to the user namespace stuff. So using Podman run, you can use a UID map, and that is basically telling Podman that map UID 0 in the container to UID 100,000 on the host, and do it for the next 5,000 UIDs there. So that's the range. 
I'm going to run this uh, detachment in the background, and we can use the podman top command uh, to look at what the user what the user ID is in the in the container and in the host. So as you can see, it's root and hundred thousand. Uh, the latest flag is just a really cool feature we have in podman that, that tells it that just use the container the most recent container you've created, so you don't have to go back and get the ID of the container and all. Uh, when I do a PS of the same thing uh, and graph for sleep on the host, you can see that it is running with the UID, user ID, 100,000. Uh, to show you how what I meant by each container having its own user namespace, I'm going to create another one but map it to 200,000 instead. Same thing as before. And as you can see, the process is here. One of them has 100,000, the other has 200,000. So if any process from the container that has a UID 100,000 breaks out and tries to talk to the one with 200,000, it won't be able to. they are completely different user namespaces. Cool. So the fork exec model I wanted to um, show um, it's pretty easy to show. So on my host system, if I to see who I am, I can um, cat proc self login UID, and you'll see that it's 1,000. That's the user um, currently um, logged in on the host. So now I'm going to run a, um, a container, just a Fedora container. I'm going to um, cat proc self login UID from inside the container. And as you'd expect, since it's a fork exec model, the um, the, lo the person logged in there is, is me, login 1000. Now, the interesting thing is in with another container runtime, if I do that same exact command, um, what does that mean? Well, that is the number that equates to um, an unsigned 32-bit 30, int. I think I said that right, yeah. Um, and that means that that's I have no idea who that is. That has that user has never logged into the system. Um, so I hope you see the problem here. Um, and that is, if I try to do something tricky, like um, touch the Etsy shadow file. Now back on the host, um, a sysadmin can use the audit search tool to see exactly who that was. User 1000, who is cloud user, did that. Um, so the interesting thing is uh, I can run a Docker command and I can um, volume out the root directory and touch Etsy shadow. And now I, I see someone did it again. And who was it? Um, well, that user is um, unset, which means uh, I have no idea who that was. And so you, uh, you can see the problem here and the benefit of that fork exec model um, in being able to audit who's doing what on your system. Now, um, I want, we want to show a couple of the neat features of the podman top command. Um, podman top just um, prints out in, an, in a nice, pretty way. Some You can use it to see what security things are enabled with your container. So here I'm just going to run um, a Fedora container. And if I pass label to, pseudo, to podman top, you can see the SE Linux um, label that's currently there. I can, I can make sure that my container is running with seccom filtering turned on. Um, also, you can check and see what capabilities are currently um, effective inside the container. I'll talk a little bit more about the Linux capabilities when we talk about Cryo next. But Podman Top is a really useful um, command. Uh, back to slides. So, so um, Scopio is the. So we've. So we've. We've. Um, we know what a container is. We've created the image. We've played around with it on our local system with Podman, and um, now we're ready to. You know, what do we use to manage the image? What do you when you add security to a system? The first thing you want to do is not have to run root, and there's no reason to run root when you're managing your images. Um, Scopio is our tool to. Um, Originally, it was designed so that we could inspect a remote image from a remote registry. Um, before Scopio, in order to check out an image, you had to download that image to your system and then run inspect on it. Now, uh, you can run Scopio inspect from a, a remote registry and get some useful information, um, the JSON file that describes the image and the layers and who owns it. And um, But the, the important thing is that it can 
uh, you don't need root to run Scopio. There's no daemon. There's no reason for root. Um, and also, since the original use case was so great, we've added some other things like you can copy an image from one registry to another and never have to even have that image on your host system. You can um, delete images, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we mentioned this before. I, for Builder also, we can run Builder without root. So all our three tools here, Scopio, Podman, and Builder, you do not need to have root privileges to run them. You have the option to do that, but you can also do it without root privileges. So here's just an example of, a, um, of some information you can pull down. We pulled this down from the Docker Hub. You can see all the tags available. You can see um, the images in there. That's just our Docker Hub Fedora image. And um, in the spirit of like, don't run, don't download and run random crap off of the internet. That's what Scopio <laughs> solves there. Okay, so oh, we're moving right along. Yeah. So now that we have we have a tool to like, we can use it to build our container images. We have already tested and ran them locally using Podman. We have put them on registries, moved them around using Scopio. The final thing we want to do is to be able to run these containers in production, right? We want to be able to run them in Kubernetes, for example. So we, that's what Cryo does. Cryo is a container runtime interface that that helps. Uh, so Cryo is a container runtime interface that you can use to interact with the Kubernetes API to launch containers in production. Um, we firmly believe that when you're running containers in production, you should run them in read-only mode. What does this mean? It just means that processes running inside your container should not be able to write to any part of the container that came from the image, making like almost everything, every path in your container immutable. Now you're wondering, what, what if I need to run processes that write out, that write stuff to a path in the container? What if I need to save vital information? Guess what? You're actually glad that we have the read-only mode because if you were writing in the container, it, you could have lost the, you would lose the information when the container is destroyed. The way to go around to doing this is to mount volumes into your container, write to those paths, and then those paths will have, and the contents will still persist even after your containers are destroyed as those will be like linked to a path on your host. So that's what the read-only mode does in Cryo. And then uh, we'll show you that Cryo, it's uh, really convenient to set the what Linux capabilities are enabled um, system-wide for all of your containers. And um, so Linux ca capabilities are a way, um, they divvy up the, the super privilege that you can have on a Linux system. So there's like the Chrome capability, uh, the NetRaw capability. There's a list of about 40 of them. Um, but with Cryo, by default, we only enable a very small subset. I'll show you that list in a minute, um, and the idea is run with as few capabilities enabled as you can uh, and only run with the ones you need. Um, this will just, again, minimize the attack surface, minimize the chance that something can break free and wreak havoc on your host. Cryo also has the same user namespace support as Podman does. Uh, the only thing is that it's still work in progress in Kubernetes, so we're waiting for Kubernetes together so we can actually take advantage of this feature in Cryo. Oh, and uh, if anybody here works for the federal government, um, you might be interested in knowing about Cryo as your only option for running things in FIPS compliant. Um, uh, so FIPS, it, it's, a, it's a list of encryption algorithms that are permitted to be used, and um, the federal government um, pretty much it makes their employees run their systems in FIPS mode. <laughs> so... Um, Cryo is the only container runtime that knows what that is and can carry that information into the containers and enforce it. Back to demos. So the first demo is read-only mode. Um, I'm just, uh, we have a config file for Cryo. I'm just gonna show you that I've set the read-only flag to true. It's telling Cryo to run all containers in read-only mode. Restarting the Cryo daemon and, oh, so CryCTL is actually a CLI tool that you can use to debug and uh, run containers in Cryo, since Cryo was actually made to be run with Kubernetes. So this is just a way to locally do it, and we, have, we use JSON files for that. Um, so I'm using the run p to create a pod. Using that pod, I'm creating a container and starting the container. Now, I'm going to exec into the container and try to DNF install builder, for example. As you can see, that failed. It's saying it's a read-only file system, because when you DNF, it expects to write logs to var log, which is a restricted file path. 
The great thing about this is that, for example, if your container gets hacked into by mistake, the first, not by mistake, but gets hacked into, <laughs> your hacker would want to put a back door in place, right? So that next time you start up your container, they would have easy access to it. This stops it. So run your containers in read-only mode in production. <laughs> Also run with as few capabilities as possible. I want to show you um, which capabilities are enabled by default with Cryo. And it's just a small subset. And it's super easy to just go in and um, delete a couple of them. And um, all you have to do then is restart Cryo. And I'm going to start a, a pod. Um, again, the, the Cryo starting pods is a little bit cumbersome. And here, if we print out the capabilities, it's not as pretty, um, but you can see which capabilities are enabled there. And the, um, if, you're, if you're in a uh, cluster, this um, information also carries through to the pod, not just the container. So this is information about a pod in your cluster, and you can see it has those um, it has the shown gone and whichever one else I deleted, I can't remember. DAC override, I think. Uh, DAC override, yeah. Yeah. And is that... I think that's it. it? Yeah. That's oh, my gosh. the demos. <laughs> that wasn't so scary. <laughs> I, I thought it was, yeah. Okay, so now that we've told you about all these security features that come with our tools, please, please try to use them when you're actually using them so that a great guy like Dan Walsh doesn't get upset and weep. He's still good for that. <laughs> and remember the Unix founders. Yeah. <laughs> So these are the resources for you if you want the, the, the GitHub links to our tools. And the demo script is right up there if you want to get it, play around with it. And we actually have this coloring book. So if you didn't go to Dan's talk or Scott's talk in the morning and didn't get this, we have them here for you to take out. It's just a book that highlights the tools we have in a high level. And you can learn as you color. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. If you have questions, I'll, I'll combine with the mic. Yes, we, we explained everything perfectly. <laughs> yeah. No questions? Yeah. Just a few closing things. Uh, so don't forget tomorrow at 9.30 um, uh, to attend the keynote uh, speech by Chris Wright, our CTO, uh, Red Hat CTO. Um, and tonight, if there are party tickets, I think they're still available. So um, if you don't have it, you can go walk up to the registration. They should be able to do. Thank you so much. Thank you.